Great. Okay, good morning, everybody. Happy Thursday. Uh, we Today we have Kara Snow and Steve Colby for um, to give a little presentation on boreal chickadees. And so I'll give a little introduction. Steve Colby is an avian ecologist at the Natural Resources Research Institute, so NRRI at the University of oh, Minnesota. You are so big. And can we please mute our phone <laughs> or your your microphone, please. Let's see. Thank you. Um, so Steve spends his work hours focusing on researching northern forest species such as common nighthawks, Connecticut warbler, rusty blackbird, and boreal chickadees. He spends his non-work hours watching and photographing birds migrating along the shore of Lake Superior. So I'm sure you're spending some time doing that uh, right now with the migration in full-blown um, and then Kara Snow is a recent master's graduate from the University of Minnesota Duluth and is now works now working as a researcher for the Natural Resources Research Institute in the Avian Ecology Lab. And she got her master's degree studying the breeding ecology of boreal chickadees in northern Minnesota and has assisted on projects researching Connecticut warblers, golden winged warblers, and flammulated owls, hopefully I said that right. Um, but I'm really excited you guys are here today because as the Northern Forest Conservation Delivery Network, we are using research as like the best available science to assess the statuses and the productivity of our Northern Forest birds. And this is really just ultimately informing and evaluating um, management practices to or deliver conservation. So I will hand it over to you and excited for your presentation. Thank you. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks everyone for being here. Kara and I are excited to talk about uh, boreal chickadees today. Um, yeah, we both have given a bunch of uh, presentations about boreal chickadees, and uh, in the early part of the um, the study, it was a lot of conjecture and stuff like that. So it's very exciting now to have lots of results to share with you all. Um, but before we get going on the boreal chickadee. Uh, portion of the study, I thought I'd give a little background about the study. The boreal chickadee study that we're going to talk about today is a very small part of a very large study uh, that was funded by the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund here in Minnesota. Um, and that study focused on uh, peatland forests um, throughout the state of Minnesota. And so just a little bit of background about that. Um, you know, these habitats are awesome. Uh, magnificent um, and poorly understood and studied uh, for a variety of reasons. Many of them are hard to get to. Uh, they're not exactly easy to um, walk around in. And so we're talking when we're talking about uh, peatlands, we're talking about areas in which there uh, is decomposition uh, that is so slow or non-existent that peat uh, starts to accumulate on the uh, in in the ground. Uh, and in forested peatlands, uh, then we start getting. Um, shrubs like a uh, Labrador tea or uh, leather leaf, bog laurel, that sort of stuff, and then trees growing on that. So mostly black spruce and tamarack. So um, in Minnesota and more widely, we want to have a, a holistic understanding of how these amazing um, uh, forests work. And that was the goal of this uh, wider project of which the boreal chickadee uh, portion is a small portion. Many of you likely have heard um, me or others in our group talk about Connecticut Warbler portion of this project as well. Uh, some uh, some of that is published already. Um, what you'll hear from Kara and uh, myself today is going to be submitted this month uh, for publication. And we are already, uh, you know, providing lots of management recommendations like Jamie was alluded to, uh, to various uh, uh, land managers and land uh, owners throughout the state and region. Okay, so why do we care about peatlands? Uh, well, one thing is there there aren't a lot of them in the world, only 3% of the world's surface, but they hold an awful lot of carbon. Uh, we've been hearing a lot about that recently, and so that's an important uh, part of the equation. There's a lot of them in, in the state in which we work, Minnesota. Um, they also are uh, undergoing a lot of different threats. Uh, one of the big ones is climate change, of course, and so we're sort of thinking about climate change in all parts of this study, um, including uh, the the bird portion, um, but you know, very uh, one of the effects of climate change is that eastern larch beetle, which is a native uh, beetle uh, that affects tamarack trees or eastern larch trees, 
um, has been running rampant through uh, the forests um, in this area. And uh, almost half of the, or over half of the stands have been infected by this beetle. And, and it can be so severe that it does kill the majority of the trees in the stand. And this is being exacerbated by climate change in that they are able to uh, multi-brood in many years because of the lack of cold or uh, things of that nature. And so um, this is habitat for a lot of species of birds and other wildlife, uh, and uh, it is being uh, uh, sort of decimated at an alarming rate. And so that's one of the reasons why we're interested in this uh, habitat. Uh, now there is that current uh, harvest recommendations are based on thinking from a long time ago uh, that are, um, to be frank, not particularly ecologically sound. And so we're interested in uh, providing other and, and better options uh, for harvesting, particularly black spruce in, in the area, instead of uh, traditional clear cutting in large blocks or occasionally in strips, um, um, more uh, uh, ecologically sound and uh, a more nuanced versions of this. So there's a large team of folks, as you imagine, that are working on this project. Um, the the uh, primary investigator is Marcelo Winmuller Campione, who is down at the University of Minnesota in the Twin Cities. Um, and <clears throat> she is in charge of looking at the vegetation uh, portion of this study. Um, Rob Slezak was down there. Now he's out in the Pacific Northwest for the Forest Service, but he's in charge of looking at the hydrology in these um, various areas throughout the state. Alexis, many of you know very well. Um, she's in charge of the wildlife portion of this project that Karen and I are going to be talking about shortly here. And then we have some amazing partners at the Minnesota DNR who have been instrumental. Um, and you know uh, many or all of these folks. Um, including Mike, who's on the call today. Uh, they have been uh, amazing uh, partners, uh, providing uh, site selection help, all the way to uh, providing places for Kara and I to stay while we're stomping around in the bogs in the northern part of the state. So thank you. So the study is we, we picked out 48 stands throughout the, the state of Minnesota, um, and they're broken into uh, these uh, 12 different uh, bins. So there's uh, and there's four replicates in each of these age by cover type class. So that is, if my math is right, 48 stands throughout the state of Minnesota. Um, so we looked at stagnant spruce, so that is um, black spruce stands that are very wet, very slow growing, often relatively stunted looking small trees, um, but those trees can be very old. Productive black spruce that grows much quicker, less, less wet, and then uh, tamarack. And then we looked at uh, the four different uh, age groups you can see there. And then we had a nice um, suite of these uh, uh, study areas throughout the, the range of these peatland forests in Minnesota, as you can see on the map on the left. Okay, so I'm just real quick results uh, before we start talking about the bird part, the cool part. Um, you know, hydrology, we looked at that. We had wells in all the sites. Uh, and we had some interesting results looking at some of the water table dynamics are a little more stable than uh, Maybe we would have thought, so that's good news, but then we can see really uh, strong effects of precipitation and drought, which is one of the climate change things that we're uh, looking at and expecting in the future. Vegetation communities vary between these cover types, even though uh, we think of them often, they're all lumped together as just peatland forests. They're not, even black spruce forests. Uh, they are, have unique uh, vegetation communities, um, whether or not they're stagnant or productive. And especially as they get old, they're very, uh, uh, biodiversity rich. And then one thing that uh, some of the vegetation folks were looking at is tree regeneration. One, one of the things that people are concerned about is that trees aren't regenerating in like uh, older stands. We find that they are it, when, when black spruce and tamarack get old enough, you know, we have natural regeneration. And what we're really excited to see is like getting uh, sort of uh, multi-age stands. And that's going to, as you might imagine, attract a lot of uh, different and diverse uh, communities of wildlife. And then uh, we looked at wildlife. Uh, and as you can see, uh, for birds that are peatland specialists, um, the uh, diversity really increases as you get old, especially in uh, uh, stagnant black spruce, which is the blue bars uh, in the middle, but really across the board. And so that's um, maybe not a surprise, but it's something that is excellent to document. Uh, and with that, I'm going to uh, leave it and I'm going to 
uh, let Kara share her screen now. She's going to talk about the first part of our uh, boreal chickadee research, and then I'll hop back on later. Great. Thanks. Let's see. I think I think you have to, there you go. Is my screen sharing now? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, wait. Hold on. There we go. There we go. Great. Good. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about um, some of the research that we did specifically on boreal chickadees in um, these forested peatlands. And um, specifically, I'm going to talk about the research that I did for my um, master's degree. Um, and there we go. Um, just a little quick introduction of your for your new favorite bird. Um, this is the boreal chickadee. They are closely related to black cap chickadees, which I'm sure we're all pretty um, familiar with. They live exclusively in the um, northern boreal coniferous forests, and they are a forest interior and an area sensitive species. So they require kind of like large tracts of land, and they prefer to live more in like the center of the forest as opposed to the edges. Um, in Minnesota, they're at the very like southern edge of edge of their range, and in Minnesota, they are pretty closely associated with mature old growth black spruce, um, which Steve was just telling us a bit about. They are secondary cavity nesters, so they will nest in um, cavities uh, made by woodpeckers or other natural cavities, but they'll also um, luckily readily use nest boxes, which is good if you are wanting to study their breeding ecology instead of spending many hours trying to chase them around and find them in natural cavities which we found in the first year of this study is nearly impossible. Um, and in Minnesota, they are listed as a species in greatest conservation need with declines attributed to habitat loss, degradation, and fragmentation. Um, and results from the Minnesota National Forest Breeding Bird Monitoring Program is showing declines on their um, yearly point counts. And that's also, um, in line with regional surveys. And so that is kind of like summarizes their conservation status. But in fact, we don't really know a lot about boreal chickadees. And one reason, um, as Steve mentioned earlier, they live in places that are kind of hard to reach. It's hard to move around in bogs. Um, they also lack a broadcast song. So um, like, you know, how black cap chickadees have that, um, that like, hey, sweetie song that they do um, to kind of like mark their territory. Boreal chickadees don't do that. So they're kind of a more quiet bird. So they're not always picked up on point counts. Um, so we there are a lot of gaps in the knowledge for this species, like how big are their territory sizes? There's not a lot of winter studies on these birds. As you can imagine, that sounds pretty awful. Um, and we don't know a lot about their nesting ecology specifically. So like the most comprehensive study on the breeding biology of this bird comes from a single study in 1975. But one question that we had for this bird, because um, we know that they are showing declines attributed to um, fragmentation, we want to know specifically how fragmentation might be impacting the quality of habitat for breeding boreal chickadees. Um, and we wanted to investigate this specifically because if you can identify like how, where, and why you're losing birds in a population, that can help you mitigate further declines. This is what we want. Um, and anything that we can do to increase breeding success will help bolster those populations. Um, this is probably not news to anybody in this um, chat, but um, a little overview of fragmentation. So. Fragmentation refers to the breaking up of contiguous habitats into smaller pieces of habitats. That not only removes habitat from the area, but it also reduces the amount of core area. Remember I was saying earlier that boreal chickadees are an interior species, and it also increases edges. And that's an important thing to note because there have been a lot of studies on um, 
the effects of edges on breeding birds, um, particularly with uh, nest parasitism and predation. Um, so that's a little brief inter, um, overview of fragmentation, but quickly I want to talk about habitat quality and how do we measure it. So it's not um, necessarily as straightforward as it might sound. Um, there are many ways to go about this, and older studies would look at things like the like breeding bird density and try to infer quality from that, but that can sometimes be misleading. Um, and for many species, they might have different habitat needs depending on um, the age of the bird or the season. So there are kind of two other um, approaches that ecologists can take. So you can measure habitat attributes directly by looking at things like critical resources, like nesting sites or food abundance, or you can also measure ecological constraints like predation risks or competition. Then you can also measure the actual organism of interest directly. So that means looking at demographic measures like reproduction, survival, recruitment, and individual condition. Um, and looking at the individual isn't pretty important because it, it's actually the quality of habitat effects on the individual level, which is then carried over into the population level. Um, and so ideally a study that's looking to um, determine habitat quality will use a combination of approaches and methods and then also use statistical methods to determine if there's an association with these measurements to things like vegetation or landscape features, which can be actually managed for. So um, uh, we conducted this study in the Red Lake Wildlife Management Area um, in Northern Minnesota. We deployed over 350 nest boxes in primarily black spruce dominated peatlands. Um, and the stands that we put our nest boxes up in, they varied between, uh, they varied amongst like the size of the stands and also the degree of fragmentation in the landscape, which allowed us to study how fragmentation might be impacting the breeding for these birds. So some of the things that we looked at, we measured were provisioning rates, body condition and growth rates. And these, we chose these because they're all indications of habitat quality. So provisioning rates can tell you something about food availability or quality, and the same goes for body condition and growth rates. So some of the specific questions that we were asking for this part of the study were, do these measurements vary with fragmentation or food availability? Do they, do they vary between those study sites or between the different years of the study? And does fragmentation or habitat qualities um, impact the food availability for boreal chickadees. So to measure food availability, we conducted arthropod surveys. We used the branch clipping method. Boreal chickadees will forage by um, gleaning insects off of like the mid to outer parts of the branches. So we thought that branch clipping would be a good representation of food availability for this species. Um, and then later we identified all of the arthropods collected on those surveys to order. And for provisioning observations, we recorded nest boxes two times during the nesting period to count how many times parents come in and out of the box to feed their young. Um, and provisioning rates can tell you a little bit about how much food is available, right? If you, you can imagine if you are a bird going out to look for food for your young, if food is readily available in the habitat, you can come back and forth more quickly. Um, however, I will say that during the time that we were conducting the study, another paper came out from Canada specifically on boreal chickadee provisioning, turns out. <laughs> and they actually found that boreal chickadees will increase provisioning to compensate for low prey quality, which is pretty interesting. So um, when there are kind of like less nutritious bugs in the environment, they'll, they'll feed more to give their nestlings a more nutrition. So that kind of throws an interesting piece into this, um, which I'll talk about later. Um, so we calculated provisioning rates and we use that um, to index food availability um, and prey quality, which can be used to determine habitat quality. And I have a quick little video because I had many, many, many hours of nest box footage. So I wanted to show just some like typical provisioning observations and also some really interesting um, attempted nest predation events, just because uh, it's fun to watch a little video. So this is a, a pretty typical 
envisioning ones coming out the other ones coming in so so this would be counted as a provisioning event a little later in the day this is interesting because this individual as you can see is banded so that was one of the youngsters from the previous year came back to nest in the nest box and then a couple examples of some attempted predation. This is just a red squirrel coming to check this out. And some very brave parents. Red squirrels are so cute, but after doing this study, I don't like them anymore. And this was like the main treat of watching all of these hours of provisioning videos is that we had a pine martin come in to investigate. Um, but we have latches on the side of our boxes so that they can not lift them from the side. Um, so eventually, this guy gave up. Do you watch all of this manually? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which wasn't so bad. Right. Yeah. Kind of relaxing in the middle of winter. <laughs> and this was the very last video of all of my provisioning videos that I watched. And I got this treat. So after, you know, 40 hours or something. working hard trying to get in there yeah, it eventually gives up i think it was there for like a half an hour though and then it just left and this and this nest box was successful yeah so i thought that was just a neat little interesting thing back to business um so nestling growth rates i measured nestlings three times during the nestling period i um created a body condition index um, by calculating the residuals of a linear regression of nestling body mass over the tarsal length. Um, and then I also calculated growth rates for, um, for nestlings. Again, um, going back to thinking about habitat quality, um, if we're using statistical analysis to see if there are any forest characteristics that might influence faster growth rates or chicks that are fatter and healthier before they leave the nest can be really good indicators of habitat quality. Um, so about those um, forest characteristics, we conducted vegetation surveys at each of our study sites, 20 systematic vegetation surveys, looking at things like canopy density, total tree count, what species are there, canopy composition, average tree height. And then we looked at fragmentation metrics um, using cover types classified within ArcGIS and um, the R package landscape metrics to kind of get some metrics to use for our analysis. And just really quick, with our arthropod um, surveys, we identified 11 different orders of arthropods. And in 2021 and in 2022, um, spiders were the most um, abundant orders that we found on, on those clippings. And then um, followed by diptera in 2021 and hemiptera in, 20, in 2022. And we used these um, abundance results and diverse Shannon Wiener index of um, diversity results to use later in our modeling. We use generalized linear mix models, and we found that the top model showed that provisioning rates were correlated with the distance of the nest site to the edge of the forest patch. So um, there were higher provisioning rates, um, actually, as the nest was closer to the edge, which we found was interesting. Um, which I'll touch upon a little bit later. And then we also found that growth rates were positively influenced by the percentage of black spruce forest cover type at both the nest site scale, so right around the nest site, and then also on a larger landscape scale. 
And you'll see this will be kind of a theme that black spruce um, cover type is an important thing for breeding boreal chickadees. We also found that that pre-fledged body condition that I talked about earlier was correlated with the arthropod diversity within the site from those um, surveys that we took. So we wanted to see, well, okay, well, what's influencing arthropod diversity potentially? And we found that that was correlated with the amount of black spruce, again, in the landscape and also the heterogeneity of tree density. Um, so if there were patches from those uh vegetation surveys that we took earlier, patches of denser trees and a little bit less denser trees that tended to have um, areas with higher arthropod diversity. I also modeled boreal chickadee nest success. So we had in total um, 35 that we used for this study, boreal chickadee nests. Um, of those 35, 10 of those failed, um, eight of which were depredated and two are abandoned. And we modeled nest survival using a binomial fail-fledge response. And our top performing models for this showed that nest survival um, was best explained by the age of nests. So if you can see here, as the nest progresses from the egg stage to the nestling stage, it has a less of a chance of daily survival. And that makes sense. Um, as those eggs hatch, they turn into begging nestlings and parents have to come in and out of the nest box a lot, which draws attention to the nest and um, makes it more obvious to predators. And this is something that many, many nest success studies show. But we also found that the amount of black spruce forest around the nesting location um, was important for nest survival. So there was higher survival when there was, when nest boxes were surrounded by more black spruce forest. So kind of to sum this up, nestling growth rates were associated with the amount of black spruce forest in the landscape. Um, nestlings that were reared in stands with higher arthropod diversity had a better pre-fledged body condition. And arthropod diversity was correlated with, the again, the amount of black spruce in the landscape and also the variability of the stand structure. And we also found that breeding success was higher when nesting locations were surrounded by greater amounts of black spruce forest. So definitely starting to have a theme here. And the last part of this study was a diet study, which um, is kind of my favorite part. Um, so... We want to see what boreal chickadees were feeding their young. What are nestlings eating? And understanding diet is pretty crucial for kind of having like the full picture of ecology of a species. And it can also be useful for conservation, particularly if you want to manage a habitat for food availability. So some of the specific questions I was trying to answer were, what are they eating? Um, are boreal chickadees selecting certain prey items when they're feeding their young? And were there any differences in diet between the study sites or the years of the study? So to do this, I use DNA metabar coding. Um, and um, how I went about this was I would take fecal samples, so poop samples from young birds at three different times during the, the nestling stage. And then um, DNA is actually conserved um, as it goes through digestive tract. So DNA of the food that we eat comes out in your feces. Um, so I would take, I took fecal samples and extracted the DNA from fecal samples. I used PCR and um, aligned si those sequences that I extracted with a reference database to determine what specific arthropods um, were being fed to those birds. And the results from this, I, um, I had 105 fecal samples that I successfully extracted DNA from. And in those, I found 11 orders of arthropods and 123 unique bug species were found. Um, the top, the most frequently occurring arthropod orders were diptera, so like flies, lepidoptera, likely caterpillars, and spiders and hemiptera, true bugs. And I also found in over 20% of samples, beetles, mayflies, and caddisflies. Between the two study years, we found that Arania was detected at a higher frequency in 2022 um, than in 2021. And also Trichoptera was um, 
found in much higher levels in 2022 than in 2021. And this is pretty interesting to us and something that we've actually been exploring more in this study. Um, if you can remember in 2021, we had that massive drought year, right? Um, and Trichoptera are caddisflies and they require water for their larval stage. So what we were kind of wondering is if that drought affected the abundance of Trichoptera. If you can see in 2022, the non-drought year, they are a very um, frequent in fecal samples. So they appear to be an important prey item for this bird. And that makes us wonder how boreal chickadees um, will respond to you know, potential increases in drought and climate change and how their diet might change over the years um, if that continues. Um, and we wanted to see if there was some kind of degree of selection for boreal chickadees feeding their young. And we did find that diptera, so flies and lepidoptera occurred more frequently in fecal samples than they did in those arthropods um, surveys that we took. Um, quick note about the sampling bias for branch clipping. It's really good for um, for surveying sessile or non-moving things like caterpillars, for example. Um, it's not as great for flying things or things that can kind of move out of the way as you put the bag over the branch. So it's possible that the reason that diptera was more um, frequent in the fecal samples and the arthropod surveys could have been that sampling method bias. Um, however, it's a really good method for collecting things like Lepidoptera um, or caterpillars. Um, and also there have been many studies that show that passerine birds will select for Lepidoptera when they are provisioning their young because they are easily digestible, high fat content, lots of nutrients. Um, so that is kind of, that kind of checks out for prey selection. Back to the original question about fragmentation and if it's impacting the quality of habitat for boreal chickadees. Going back, um, nestling growth rates were positively influenced by black spruce around the nest site. And we also found that pre-fledged body condition, so how fat they were before they let, left the nest was correlated with arthropod diversity. And arthropod diversity was associated with, again, black spruce forests within the landscape, um, and also the heterogeneity of tree density within the stand. So if you look at these all together, um, you can kind of infer that these findings suggest that larger structurally complex black spruce forests are high quality habitat for boreal chickadees because they provide access to diverse prey, which results in nestlings with higher growth rates and better pre-fledged body condition. And we also found that nest survival increased with the amount of black spruce around the nest site. Um, and age of nest was an indicator as I was talking about earlier. Predation was the main cause of nest failure. And there have been many studies that show, particularly in the boreal forest, that nest predators like red squirrel specifically are a lot more abundant in fragmented patches. So it's possible that fragmentation might be impacting nest survival by boreal of for boreal chickadees by increasing predator abundance. That's something that we would definitely want would want to look into more. Provisioning rates were higher for nests that were closer to the edge. So this is kind of where it gets a little bit like we're not totally sure what's going on. Um, as I mentioned earlier, provisioning rates can be an indicator of food availability, more food, higher provisioning rates. But as I said, um, there was that recent study that said that they will actually increase provisioning efforts to compensate for low quality prey. And we didn't really find that there was a correlation between nestling body condition and the distance to the edge. So it's possible that there was more food availability available next to the stand edges, but also could be that there's just crappier prey availability at the edge and that they are needing to um, provision more often to keep up with their nestlings growing. So something like extensive um, arthropod sampling efforts um, on the edge and comparing that to more in interior would be really important to learn a little bit more about food availability for this bird. We found that they rely heavily on prey items from Lepidoptera, Arania, and Diptera when provisioning their young, and they're probably actively selecting for Lepidoptera. 
So if you look at this with the pre-fledged body condition analysis, it does seem that access to a diverse suite of prey items is really important for provisioning parents. So back to, so we were talking about management implications and how that's really important. Um, larger tracts of black spruce seem like they're really important for breeding boreal chickadees and looking at you know nestling growth rates, of nest survival, et cetera. And as Steve mentioned earlier, the typical practice for um, for harvest for black spruce is clear cutting, which is really potentially detrimental to the species. It removes habitat from the landscape. Um, so, if a stand is to be logged, because you know black spruce is a really commercially um, important tree species, things like strip cutting or um, select selection cutting or shelter wood might be a little bit more favorable because they're not removing huge amounts of habitat from the landscape. Um, so any harvesting methods that would reduce fragmentation, again, if a stand is needs to be cut, we would argue that, you know, don't cut mature black spruce. Um, but anything that reduces um, fragmentation is going to mitigate further declines for this species. And also back to the, the diet part of this story. Um, so having an insight to what bugs birds are eating can be really advantageous for creating management plans. So many bugs or arthropods are generally reliant on like a few host plant species. So if you know what arthropods the birds are eating, that can help you know what plant species to manage for in the landscape. Um, and again, arthropod diversity has been positively associated with canopy co complexity in this study and also in many other studies. So certain harvest practices, again, like clear cutting, which lowers stand complexity, creating just like those even age stands might be detrimental for to food availability for forest dwelling birds. So that's huh, a very quick um, brief overview of a very long study. Um, and these are all the people who helped on this, which Steve mentioned earlier. And now I'll let Steve talk about what happens to boiled chickadees after they leave the nest in the um, in the early fledgling ages. And this is my email, if anybody wants to send me an email um, with any extra questions later. Sounds good, thanks, Kara. Okay, yeah, so if you thought that was exciting, just wait till you get a load of what happens after the boreal chickadees leave the nest. Okay, so like Kara said, we had a bunch of nest boxes up in the uh, Red Lake uh, Wildlife Management Area in northern Minnesota. Uh, we uh, color banded all the nestlings and put transmitters on a subset of nestlings from uh, each nest box for three years. And then uh, we tracked them around after they left the nest box and uh, found out where they went, where they didn't go, where they died, where they survived, uh, and a lot of their interesting behaviors. And why do we do this? Why are we interested in that period? Well, uh, the post-fledging -fledge period uh, in a bird's life cycle is a time of very high mortality. So you can see those weekly survival rates on the right there are really uh, low especially for the first week after a bird leaves the nest. So uh, we want to understand, like I said, uh, what what birds need during that really crucial time where we're getting trying to get as many birds into the population as possible. And potentially this bottleneck occurs right after they fledge and uh, go out in the world. And sometimes a lot of species use other habitats that aren't typical of what like ad adult birds uh, use. So uh, we put these transmitters on the, the cute little uh, boreal chickadee nestlings that were soon to become fledglings. Uh, we followed them around uh, and we got over the course of those three years, 550 different locations where the fledglings went. And so we went out every day and, and uh, tracked them by hand and visually found them in the trees. And we marked those trees. Um, one thing that was interesting is that um, they stuck together, uh, male and female, and all the young stuck together for quite a long time. Um, so that was helpful in uh, not having to chase all of the individual birds around all the time. And so with a lot of work and a lot of stomping around the bog, we can create a cool figure like this, where you can see, as you might expect, um, 
birds, uh, the, the fledgling border chickadees do increase uh, the distance they can move on the y-axis there as they get older. So day zero is when they leave the box. Um, so first day of fledge, and then as they uh, increase uh, time outside of the box in, in the world, uh, they do go farther. You can see right around day uh, 19, all of a sudden those error bars get massive around uh, the, the distances they move. And that is because the day zero to 18, so the first 18 or 19 days that they're um, out, of the, out of the cavity, they're with their parents. Uh, but something happens right around that day 19 time where the parents give them the boot and they have to go and find their own way somewhere else. And so you, that is why those air bites are so much larger because they are going and exploring uh, and, and trying to find new areas and habitats that they're going to uh, use for the rest of the summer and fall and potentially even into the winter as their residents in these areas. We also were able to sort of find the largest movement for any given day of all the of birds combined and that will come into play later but you can see that you know they're they're able to go uh hundreds of meters for the first couple weeks um but then they start really going sometimes uh thousands of meters uh during that um independent stage after they leave the care of their uh parents this will come into play in a second here so at each of these uh, telemetry locations, we did vegetation surveys, kind of like what Kara was talking about. And we also did a vegetation survey at a random point that was 30 meters away from the tree that we tracked those birds to. So basically we were looking at where they were actually, uh, habitat they were actually using or trees they were actually using and then habitat that they could have used, uh, could have gotten there, but they weren't there. And we've measured a lot of these things that you can see on the screen. And when we threw all this into some, uh, uh, mixed models, we found that maybe not surprising at this point in the presentation, uh, canopy cover for, of black spruce is really important. Um, and we have some uh, support for the amount of black spruce uh, in those areas as well. So uh, fledglings are more likely to be at a location where there is a higher percentage of canopy cover of black spruce and uh, a larger number of black spruce trees. Okay, here's where that those like theoretical limits of what these birds can do as they age comes into place. So we wanted to understand uh, what on the landscape is available to boreal chickadees as they age and grow and their capabilities of moving around increase. We wanna know what's available to them and what they're using and if those two things are different. So we use those uh, distances that they, that we, the maximum distance we observed at every uh, age of the boreal chickadees as a buffer around each of the points that we went to for when we were doing telemetry. And so <clears throat> logically you can sort of follow this in that uh, as a bird gets older, it is able to go a lot farther. And so you can put a buffer around a, pre a previous day's point and predict that somewhere within this buffer, that's the area that the bird could travel. But of course, it's only gonna be found in one place. And so we digitized a lot of the landscape uh, around the study area and then overlaid those buffers as the bird gets uh, older, the buffers increase, increased, and we calculate the percent of each of the different habitats that were within those buffers. And then we compared those uh, percentages within the buffer to the percent of the points that they actually, of the habitats they actually use when we went out and observed them at those uh, telemetry locations. And what we uh, came up with is this uh, interesting looking figure on the right here. The uh, Basically, we did this something called a compositional analysis where uh, we're looking at the proportion of use versus availability. So anytime you see uh, a bluish color bar uh, for a habitat type that is larger than a salmon or pinkish colored bar, that means that the boreal chickadee fledglings are using that habitat at a higher proportion than what is available on the landscape. So you can see the top two there, productive black spruce and stagnant black spruce, like we've been talking about. They use, both of those blue bars are larger than the salmon colored ones. So they use those at a higher percentage than what's available on the landscape. Um, there's more tamarack on the landscape than what they use. Same thing with all those other ones, brush. Uh, they don't like clear cuts, they don't like aspen, and, and there's quite a bit on the landscape, but they just don't use it at all. Okay, so that's good to know, a lot of this, may have been uh, obvious to people who are familiar with uh, boreal chickadees, but none of it has ever been, you know, uh, 
demonstrated before. And so that that's exciting to, to do. Uh, we also were able to, uh, similar to the survival analysis that uh, Kara was talking about in the nest, we were able to um, create some survival curves um, for uh, boreal chickadees after they left the nest. And we, during that dependent period, um, when they are with their parents, uh, their uh, survival is right around 50%, which is sort of like middle of the road. It could be a lot worse, especially for a lot of the uh, open cup nest birds. Um, they fledge very early, uh, sometimes six, seven, eight days after they hatch out an egg. Um, their their survival is quite low because uh, they are hardly birds uh, in, the, in the sense that we think of birds uh, when they have to leave the nest and go out. Um, into into the world, but boreal chickadees because they're cavity nesters, predation is a lot lower. Like you saw uh, in, with Kara's presentation, they're able to stay in the in the nest a lot longer, and so they don't fledge until um, over two weeks uh, in the box uh, after they hatch, and so they're much more fully formed birds, and they're able to um, you know grow wings and things like that, uh, and so you know that could be used for uh, escaping predators and finding food and and things like that. Um, we had a bunch of models that we looked at too, and the um, age of the fledgling, of course, was important. So as the fledgling gets older, the survival gets higher. And also a uh, percent of black spruce around the, the nest box is also uh, an important um, factor for uh, increasing the survival of these royal chickadees. So we have a nice narrative here that, you know, with Kara's stuff and, and, and the stuff I'm talking about now, black spruce is vitally important for this species. Okay. So one thing that was really fun about this study, like Kara said, is we don't know a whole lot about boreal chickadees. And so it's really, really exciting to just be able to be like, I'm writing paragraphs about what this bird just does on a day-to-day -day basis during this time of year. And so we're able to describe that. They don't split, split their brood like a lot of uh, birds do where the male takes half and the female takes half and they go their separate ways. They stick together for that period of time and then they uh, leave um, they, they leave and go out on their own at about that, uh, you know, 19-ish day uh, time frame. And then they do have the pretty strict habitat requirements that they like, but they do get a little bit looser, um, probably by necessity, as they uh, travel around um, after they leave their parents' care, probably because the parents have the best, best uh, habitat or best territories and they have to go find their own. Uh, but also they go join a bunch of uh, sort of mixed flocks. And so maybe they're like the kinglets are going over here and the, some natural warblers or black and white warblers, whatever going over here. And so they sort of just get pulled in various areas that they may not necessarily choose if it was just boreal chickadees. Um, but anyway, yeah, uh, boreal chickadees are extremely strongly tied to black spruce. They like the high canopy cover, they like the density, and they especially like those stagnant stands. And those stagnant stands, uh, if you've been in those, um, you know, to get to boreal chickadee size, uh, especially if they're uh, creating natural cavities, um, they have to be very old. So we're talking 100, but probably closer to 150 years or more uh, before they become boreal chickadee habitat. But then they seem to really, really like those areas. And so, like I said at the beginning, we have lots of uh, management recommendations that we're trying to get in uh, as many years as, as possible. Um, but keeping this mature black spruce on the landscape is vitally important for boreal chickadees. It takes an awful long time for it to uh, get back to boreal chickadee habitat. Um, and especially if we can keep uh, relatively contiguous areas that way um, and avoid creating that fragmentation that Kara was talking about, it's only going to be uh, good for boreal chickadees and a whole bunch of other of these peatland species. And at all costs, if we can avoid clear cutting, that's literally taking all uh, habitat away from those species. So, you know, we say that as much as possible. And then because boreal chickadees are uh, cavity nesters, keeping snags, but even just instead of like removing uh, trees all the way at the at the base, maybe just leaving a foot or two um, could be really helpful. Just a cut, I mean, even a few uh, uh, per acre would be really great because then those will rot. And then boreal chickadees aren't woodpeckers. They're not hammering into uh, you know, live trees or anything like that. And so they need that sort of rotting action so they can make their own cavities. And so that, that could be something that um, would create some habitat for them as well. <clears throat> okay, so that was a whirlwind of a tour through sort of like the, um, from a, a, the parents of the chickadees to the eggs, to the fledging and getting out into the world, um, a tour of the world chickadee uh, breeding ecology. Um, Thank you, uh, happy to uh, talk about any questions. And one more thing I will say is that this was part one and now starting this summer, we're going to part two. And so uh, uh, at some point we can uh, we can come back and, and fill you in on all the 
uh, extra exciting things we were learning. Uh, we're going to set we, we have set up a new study area um, to to look at boreal chickadees uh, as well. So I'm really excited to get it back out in the bog this summer. Thank you. Yes, thank you. You guys rocked it. <laughs> Anyone have any questions? I did get a question and I'm not sure if uh, you guys can answer this. Someone in the, in the chat might be able to, but uh, are the ditch banks by Cromwell in Cromwell, Minnesota, part of the, the peatlands? Um, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of thought so too. Um, I responded to that question and just guessed, but I wanted to ensure that, um, we any other questions? Yeah, and, so, and so peatland is like obviously a very broad term, so right? We have peatlands yeah. that are not forested. And so you see like, you know, like we hear like the pattern peatlands in a lot of areas. And so it's, you know, uh, sphagnum moss and then like sedge or grass. And that's the only thing that, that grows. And then as you sort of like, they get uh, less wet, I guess, or, or older than eventually, you know, trees and stuff like that start to form. And so um, those are also very interesting and unique areas, um, but we haven't. Uh, we've been mostly focusing on the the things that have trees growing out of them. Thanks, Steve. Anybody have any questions? I got a question. Uh, oh, Jamie, hey, Steve, uh, and <clears throat> Kara as well, maybe you can answer. So I don't know, how much of the place you guys work is ever surrounded by uh, upland uh, or upland conifer and does that factor into the birds lives uh, if so when if so um, have you seen any changes so I guess here in Wisconsin we've seen big declines like I've uh, mentioned in chat and kind of we've seen it in other of the the resident boreal conifer birds as well um, for various reasons uh, some caching behavior um, you know, maybe some climate change effects, whatever. But I, we also kind of hypothesize it might be related to loss of of conifer in the upland buffers or or the overall landscape where these black spruce swamps exist. Uh, can you speak to that at all or no? A little bit, yeah. That's interesting. So it's it's a little bit different in the areas that we're working. We don't have a whole lot of what I would call upland conifer. Um, particularly close to the study sites, we have a lot of upland, but like it's like us upland um, asp aspen and 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 things like that. Um, uh, one thing I will say about that is um, the area that we were working in in the Red Lake WMA is relatively like landscape wise, the patches of black spruce are relatively fragmented. They're relatively um, patchy and then they are surrounded by upland. Um, part two of our study, I see Mike uh, put something in the chat about that. Um, we're moving over to the, uh, we're moving east uh, to the Big Falls area. So sort of like the eastern side of the very large like Agassiz Lowland peatland system in northern Minnesota. And it is, that has much more contiguous, um, black, it has a lot more black spruce on the landscape, both lowland and upland. And so Ryan, at some point, I think we can uh, start to think about that. Um, but yeah, it's a pretty different system, I think, to what like the Bora tickets are are doing in, in your neck of the woods and in like the UP. Yeah, I suspected that. Thank you. Steve, I think you could probably answer this question in the chat from Brad with the um, experimental cut, maybe. Okay, yeah, Brad says, knowing that it takes a long time per to produce habitat, are foresters in Minnesota exploring multi-age management for black spruce? Um, I think that there is some some uh, momentum growing to start thinking about it. Yes, I would say writ large, no, but uh, we are encouraging along with a whole bunch of other people um, with various uh, messaging and, and so on and so forth to do yeah, exactly that. Um, to just avoid like the traditional methods, which are are really detrimental. And so I think it's been it's been a slow process, but yeah, I think that um, we are you know our our voice is being heard uh, at least a little bit, and and we're trending in that direction. We do have um, didn't get into it today, but we do have some um, 
what we're calling experimental black spruce harvest, where we're implementing some group selection and some uh, sort of traditional strip cutting, but then also really like uh, fine scale strip cutting as well to, to hopefully mimic sort of more of a thinning situation um, to sort of like bridge the gap between like the economics of, of removing uh, some black spruce off the landscape, but also keeping some of it on uh, the landscape for wildlife, hydrology, vegetation, everything, all of the above. Um, the focus of that is actually on Connecticut warblers because we are very, very concerned about the um, Connecticut warbler populations, as most of you know. Um, and they um, they prefer a much less dense um, uh, black spruce uh, and tamarack environment. And so the thought is if we can take some of these really dense stands, thin them or do some group selection or something like that, keep the um, the kind of or the uh, peatland forest bird communities there, but then gain some Connecticut warblers that are finding those really uh, microhabitats. Um, that's the hope is that you know like that would be and those and and both of those we have two study sites uh, currently uh, for that. Both of them were were sold um, you know commercially over the counter um, to loggers, and so the hope is that this is something that could be implemented um, and um, we could get away from traditional stuff and more, uh, you know, um, alternatives that meet a lot of the different goals. I just got another good question about when they cut the black spruce in Northern Minnesota, do they take in consideration the nesting time of the boreal chickadees? Um, yeah, well, I don't think so necessarily, but by uh by log log for logistical reasons, it does work out that they have to go into those black spruce stands in the winter because the the ground has to be uh, under frozen conditions for them to get their uh, equipment in there. And so, in a sense, that's good. However, as Ryan alluded to, uh, boreal chickadees and famously Canada jays cache a lot of their food that they rely on in, in the winter and for feeding, especially with Canada Jays, feeding their young very early uh, in the in the springtime. And so if you're going in there to a stand and removing a bunch of the black spruce, which is where they cache their food, um, it's not bad from a breeding standpoint, perhaps, although the territories are no longer going to be there for the breeding season. Uh, but uh, it could be particularly bad for birds that are relying on those black spruce plants uh, as essentially their uh, larder for the for the winter. I'll put on my Northern Forest Bird Network steering committee member hat and just bring up that I, I really feel like one thing that um, as a group, the network needs to tackle is the the, the peatland bird situation. Um, I, whether that's a a conference or some sort of symposium or or some sort of focus on this type, um, you know, essentially that starts with the state of the birds in that system, um, the the resident species like Canada jay, spruce grouse, boreal chickadee, etc., um, as well as the state of the habitat. You know, with where are the acres? What are the threats like climate change and pests and uh, harvest practices, et cetera? Uh, and then how we move forward, um, because there's some things we probably are not going to change. And there's other things I think we can change, or at least we have to at least try. Um, so in that sense, I see us trying to identify landscapes that have a certain resilience and where we can expect some of these birds to persist, especially if we um, do the right things. And, and then that's the second part, doing the right things are, you know, what are the best management practices? There's probably a lot of people out there that don't know the extent of the negative impacts of, you know, strip cutting the black spruce, spruce forest. So like, that's the stuff we, we've got to get out. And if we wanted to get really crazy, we could even go beyond birds into other taxa, but maybe we just take off the, the bite we, we can do for now. But I do think there's a focus there. Hopefully, I think there would be interest. And I think we have some responsibility being at the southern edge of, of that type, as well as many of these species range to try and get them to persist. Sounds good, sign me up. To coordinate it, sounds great. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs>
Sorry, uh, the my internet just cut out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Ryan, I was kind of thinking like the forestry for Minnesota birds could be like our maybe somehow we could get that message out using that program as it's as it comes to fruition. We had one last comment. Mike North made a comment about uh, finding they're finding entirely new insect species in the red, red lake peatlands. So that's fascinating. And I, I love the idea of using arthropods to help with the management practices. So thanks, Kara, for bringing that up as well. And thank you so much, Steve and Kara, for spending time with us today. It was it was a great presentation. And I'm looking forward to like trying to get this on the ground with the, the land managers and using some of these as a best management practice um, for our future forests. But with that, uh, thank you for giving us our webinar. And everybody, thanks for your questions and comments. And I really appreciate you taking time. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. Thanks for having us. That was really fun. Yeah. Great. Have a great day.